for broadcast on November 17th, track one. The Kinks have been around for 16 years, long enough to see rock tastes turn around 360 degrees to where they were when the Kinks first started in London. We'll be talking about that with Dave Davies, the lead guitarist of the Kinks, right after this from Bush Beer. Sometimes a man's got a lot to say. A.T. Brownlow. Now there's a guy who don't talk much. Last winter, I was riding fences, holed up in a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere. Boss sends A.T. out to help. First night he's there, I heard cattle noise. Bull, I says. Cow, he says. And that's all. Next morning, he's packing his saddlebags. Gotta go, I says. Can't stand an argument, he says. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West. Simple, hard-working men of few words who get the job done. Bush. Head for the beer that goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed the natural way, so it's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush beer. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. What's happening to rock and roll? There's sure a lot of it around these days. Maybe more new bands than there have ever been. But many of the people who helped make rock an international language in the 60s are now approaching 40. Some have gone beyond it. And Mick Jagger, now 37, told a reporter from Rolling Stone not long ago, there is no future in rock and roll past. Dave Davies, though, disagrees. Maybe he's getting a bit cynical. I don't know. I, I think that... Um... Now we're on the verge of something very new, I think. I mean, all right, there's only a certain amount of notes that you can play. You know, he sounds like he's a bit fed up with it all. I think it's all down to what m the mood, I think, that you're in. Debut these days, and it's not as if he hasn't been slugging away at rock and roll for roughly as long as Mick Jagger has. That's Dave with the Kinks, the band he helped co-found along with his older brother Ray, playing on their very first album back in 1964. Nowadays, Dave says, he sometimes sneaks down to a place like the Marquee Club in London, where he admits... Actually, like, in London, it's sort of, like, weird, because you walk in somewhere like that, and, like, it's like walking into the 60s, like the mods, and the... it's kind of weird. Maybe they think that there's something that we left behind in the 60s that we forgot to unravel or something. Kings created a large legacy. The song you're hearing now was the first single by The Pretenders. As it happens, it was also written by Ray Davies and was among the songs on the first Kinks album. It was one of the more obscure Kinks songs. And it's kind of nice that um, people pick out an obscure one. In actual fact, it seems, in England at any rate, that in the sort of pub circuit, like we have rock bands, each band seems to use a, or has chosen a different obscure kink song to use in their set. But all those bands hope one day to become as successful as, say, the Kinks. Whereas when the Kinks started out, says Dave, he could never think beyond the following day. Dave Davies will be talking about the beginnings of the Kinks when this interview with him continues. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 17th, track two. This is one of TV's most successful and long-running sitcoms, and one of its stars is attempting to redirect that success into other areas, such as this week's television movie, Skyward, starring Betty Davis. I'll be talking to producer Anson Williams about that after this for Agree. I can't wait to meet your daughter, sir. Well, I'll call her. Evie! What? C come here, would you? Yes, Betty. A lot of spots. Yes. What is it? Evie, I'd like you to meet a nice young man. Oh, no, my hair looks dirty. Daddy, how could you do this to me? I want to die. <clears throat> I'm afraid her cream rinse makes her hair a little greasy. May I suggest agree? Of course you'd agree. All you have to do is look at her. No, no, agree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies. Really? Sure, after I shampoo, I use agree cream rinse and conditioner and... And it, it helps stop the greasies. Right. Gee, it sounds like I would like agree. The conditioner is 99% oil free. Evie, stop crying. I'll go get some agree. And after you use it, I'll drive you to the movies, okay, Evie? No. Why not? Because you got a creepy car. What? It's a brown station wagon. I hate station. 
Some conditioners contain oils that can cause the greasies. But Agree Cream Rinse and Conditioner is 99% oil free. And try Agree Shampoo. It helps stop the greasies too. I'm glad you decided to come to the movie. Your hair looks great. Fire wagon. Hanson Williams and Ron Howard, those two zany kids from Happy Days, know they can't stay kids forever. They have begun aiming for a different kind of appeal. Take their first movie together. They co-produced, Howard also directed, the NBC TV film Skyward. It's the story of a paraplegic girl who learns to fly. It airs Thursday night, and according to Hanson Williams, who wins it here, the film makes a very important statement. I went in to pitch it to the network, Ron and I together, we were passionate. It's important now to inspire people to say, hey, you know, this film is dedicated to everybody who wants to reach Skyward. How did they react? The people of the networks, that is. Well, when we first pitched it, they cried. At any rate, no matter what happens with his first fling at producing, Anson Williams is doing another year of like Ron Howard and Donnie Most, who have put those days behind them. Why is Anson staying on? Well, first of all, I really enjoy the show. I mean, you're and pushing I just find 30 not... now, though. I mean, yeah, I'm 31. Yeah, well, you're but 31. I think they're marrying me on the show this year. Is it kind of peculiar not working with the same people? I feel nude. Yes, it is different not having because you're used to, after seven years you're used to having a certain chemistry with people. Is it still fun? It is fun. It seemed to come across on the show. I mean, as dumb as sometimes the show is, it does look as if the performers on that show are enjoying what they're doing. I, well, I, we do, and I think that's why America picked up on the show so much, because they, they feel the vibes, and it makes them feel good. It's funny, we never had a good review on Happy Days, I don't think. But I've never known a cast that's done more for the public, ever what, in the history of television, mean? in terms of you know giving your support to benefit of us. If it sounds as if Anson Williams is blowing his own charitable horn, you're probably right. But it seems there's more horn to blow. There's the Happy Days cast contributions to show business. Henry Winkler's into production. He's, he did that, put that thing on with the DeBolts. Tom Bosley's into production. He's got a couple of feature films that he's in, behind of coming out. Marion Ross is a wonderful dramatic actress going in other areas. There's going to be a lot of improvements in, from our cast. The star of Skyward, Anson Williams' latest contribution to the industry, is Susie Gilstrip, who is, in reality, a girl confined to a wheelchair. William says he's convinced it will become a TV series, perhaps a kind of happy days for the handicapped. Then again, I guess that's the way a lot of people think of that series to begin with. This is Lou Irwin. For broadcast on November 18th, track one. The Kinks are probably a more popular band today than they've ever been, but they've been pretty popular before. We'll be talking to Dave Davies, the lead guitarist of the group, about the beginnings of the kinks right after this for Agree. Oh, great master, far to seek your wisdom. Is that your daughter with the, uh... Bag over her head. Bag. Yes, say hello, April. Hi. Why is she, Her cream uh... rinse gives her hair the greasy. Oh, daddy. Yes, that bag looks like it held a six-year supply of French fries. Thanks. What can we do, sire? Well, let's see here. Take the root of the imbo bush. I tried that. The juice of the beagle berry. Look, nothing works. I'll have permanent oh. greasies. Oh, no. Now, now, look, I'll tell you what my kids use. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. Agree. Agree. The conditioner is 99% oil-free. Oh. So it helps stop the greasies. No more greasies. Greasies, I won't have to brown bag it. Yes, my daughter's hair became so beautiful she was elected homecoming queen at Guru U. Wow. How can I thank you for telling me about Agree? Give me some advice. <clears throat> Should I let my daughter wear pantyhose? How old is she? 28. Oh, then I think... Both legs? Yes, both. Fine. You can search the wide world over and may never find anything that can help three cream rinse and conditioner. And be sure and try Agree shampoo. It helps stop the greasies, too. You Really Got Me was the first hit single on both sides of the Atlantic for a young British group called The Kinks. The year was 1964. But if the music still sounds like its resemblance to what's going on in rock music today, in its energy and its somewhat defiant roughness. Dave Davies has noticed that resemblance. Dave is the lead guitarist for The Kinks. And he says... Some of the new bands that are coming out now, it's, it's very reminiscent of what we were doing like in those days and there's similar sort of frustrations and the energy is very similar it may be that the energy of the times and the energy of the kings have finally come into sync this version of you really got me is from their latest album a live set and they are probably bigger stars in america at the moment than they've ever been I'll 
Indeed, they've been touring the States this fall, a long way from 1964, when Dave Davies... There was a store in London called Dobell's at the time. It's still there. And, like, it's um, an obscure record collector's shop, and we used to sort of hang out there and see what they had. And we'd occasionally come across, a, like, a Lead Belly record or something, because he was so so good at picking out all those classic blues riffs, which is like... <laughs> And once the Kinks began performing, there was Dave, his older brother Ray, and two others. Their rise to the top was classically fast. In Britain, they had one hit after another. And, says Dave... When I think back on it, it's like some sort of flash. You know, I don't think I cared to whether it was going to last a year or ten years. It didn't even enter my head. It was a very instant thing, a very day-to-day -day thing. I think because I left school and went straight into um, rock and roll, really. I suppose the first few years of it were a bit weird for me, a bit crazy. I believe that you and me last forever. Those first few years also brought the first of a thousand questions for Dave. How did it feel to be Ray Davies' younger brother? Dave will be talking about that, but this interview with him continues tomorrow. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Agree. For broadcast on November 18th, Track 2. There is a dividing line today in those of the past, and the dividing line is called the fringe. If there had been no fringe, there would be no Monty Python. We'll be talking to John Cleese of the Pythons about that, right after this, from Bush Beer. Everybody talks about the weather, but the way they do it in the West is kind of special. Funny thing about the weather, it's always too something or too nothing. Too dry, too wi windy. Oh, windy. Oh, I'll tell you about windy. Up North Dakota, we had what we called a window meter. A piece of heavy log chain hung on a post. Most pretty calm days, the breeze just had that chain kind of standing straight out. But when them links commenced to snapping off in the breeze, why well, you knew to expect some pretty rough weather. Here then is a blast. The rugged weather and the rugged people who endure it. Bush. Head for the beer that goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed the natural way so it's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush beer. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, that's the royal box. But there's no, royal, no royalty there. No royal person is gracing the royal box. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're crouching. <laughs> in the early 60s, a group of English comedians emerged out of the venerable institutions of higher education there known as Oxford and Cambridge. They called their act the Fringe. Before them, most English comedians came from relatively poor areas and left scene. The Fringe tickled the intellect as well as the funny bone, and it attracted many young university students, like John Cleese, who was studying law at the time. And I remember at the time, but as I sat there, I found that I was actually stuffing my scarf, you know. The, is that the word you use in America? Scarf, scarf? Yeah. I was actually stuffing it into my mouth and biting it. I wasn't aware I was doing it <laughs> for a few so much. And so I just accepted that this was the funniest show that I'd ever seen, and I tried to get in the next night, and of course it was sold out. How do you spell C-A-T? Cut! Well <laughs> Question two. Name two English queens called Elizabeth. Jim. <laughs> Question three. What is the Goon Show's first name? And give John Cleese had been raised on the Goon Show, Britain's movie, starring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe, and Spike Milligan. And John Cleese's first professional job in comedy came in radio in the early 60s. By that time, radio comedy shows had virtually disappeared in America, but in England, they were going strong. And John Cleese would write a couple of comedy skits and then sit in an audience watching people around him react to what he had written. By doing that, he says... I checked money against what the audience thought was funny. But certainly different audiences must laugh at different things. It mm -hmm. does seem to me that there isn't anything more subjective than humor. 
and that uh, one audience will laugh hysterically at one joke and the next audience may not laugh at all at that same joke. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it is frighteningly subjective at times. And there are certain do audiences laugh more on Fridays than they do on Wednesdays. Or why do they laugh more at half past eight than they do at half past six? But I mean, they are. That, you can say, is almost invariable. And out of lessons like that, Monty Python's Flying Circus was born. More on that when this interview with John Cleese continues tomorrow. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 19th, track one. Dave Davies is probably the most famous younger brother in rock and roll. Dave is lead guitarist for the Kinks, but his older brother is Ray Davies, the group's songwriter and lead singer. We'll be talking to Dave about that right after this for Agree. I can't wait to meet your daughter, sir. Well, I'll call her. Evie! What? C come here, would you? She's got a lot of spots. Yes. What is it? Evie, I'd like you to meet a nice young man. I'm afraid her cream rinse makes her hair a little greasy. May I suggest agree? Of course you'd agree. All you have to do is look at her. No, no. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies. Really? Sure. After I shampoo, I use agree cream rinse and conditioner. And, and it, it helps stop the greasies. Right. Gee, it sounds like I... Agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil free. Evie, stop crying. I'll go get some agree. And after you use it, I'll drive you to the movies, okay, Evie? No. Why not? Because you got a creepy car. What? It's a brown station wagon. I hate it. Some conditioners contain oils that can cause the greasies. But Agree Cream Rinse and Conditioner is 99% oil-free. And try Agree Shampoo. It helps stop the greasies, too. I'm glad you decided to come to the movie. Your hair looks great. Your station wagon. Ray Davies is the focal point of the Kinks. Along with his younger brother Dave, Peter Quave, and Mick Avery, Ray founded the Kinks in 1964. Since then, as lead singer and songwriter, he has led them from their early hits, songs like All Day and All of the Night, to their next 70 with Lola, to their current eminence in America. This version of Lola is from their latest album, A Live Set. The Kings have never been superstars exactly, but Ray Davies has acquired fame nonetheless, although he himself has not agreed to an interview with anyone for some time. His younger brother Dave, meanwhile, has acquired something else. It's like, um, you just, did I ever feel overshadowed by Ray? Yeah. Ray like being the front man. But I felt, I've always felt that um, I had a very significant role to play within the band, and it, it's not always necessary to be a, you know, an apparent sort of figurehead to be important. I mean, a band's only, only as important as everybody else in the band for it to work will do the same job. And in fact, Dave Davies has no doubt influenced a generation of rock guitarists. But the fame of the Kinks, he readily acknowledges, is based at least as much as on their music, on the sensibility of Ray Davies. As Dave puts it, You can still say something serious and be funny, and sometimes you can say something more serious by saying something funny. Indeed, one of the sharpest satires of the Sierra was a King song, Dedicated Follower of Fashion, which came out smack dab in the middle of the swinging in 1966. Still, Dave suspects that as the years wore on, fans began to be intimidated by his brother's wit. In the late 60s, the Kinks recorded Shangri-La. People got upset about it. They thought that, you know, who, who are these people? They supposed supposedly have lots of money having a go at the middle classes. But they missed the point that it was sympathetic as well. Today, though, the kinks are probably bigger than they've ever been. And Dave Davies says that audiences are more sophisticated now. This interview with him will continue tomorrow. This is Luke for Agree. Broadcast on November 19th, Track 2. Britain and America join two countries separated by a common language, and nowhere is that division more apparent than in comedy. John Cleese of Monty Python will be talking about that after this from Bush Beer. There's poetry in the West, 
You can hear it in the way people talk about everyday things, like fences. There's a lot of sorry things can happen to a fence. Or children. She's cuter than a speckled pup under a red wagon. The cowhand's bunkhouse. I hung my clothes on the floor so they wouldn't fall down and get lost. Even personal finances. I'm so broke I can't even pay attention. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West. The everyday poetry of its people. Bush. Head for the beer that always goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed just one way, the natural way, for a taste that's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush beer. Head for the mountain. Head for Bush beer. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Point of going abroad if you're just another tourist carted yeah. around in buses surrounded by sweaty mindless oaths from Ketchin and Boventry yeah. Yeah. with their block backs and their bardigans and their transistor radios yeah. complaining about the TO yeah. they don't make it properly do yeah. they yeah. and stopping at endless with your comedy Comedy doesn't and always and travel well what is funny to a New Yorker is not necessarily funny to a Nebraskan and what is funny to an Englishman may be positively incomprehensible to an American and vice versa what I recommend to you is I'm being herded into endless hotel mirror miles and bells Nobody understands that fact of life better than John Cleese of Monty Python. In fact, Cleese himself often finds American humor baffling. He recently watched Robert Williams performing with a group at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, and he says, Now and again, at certain points in the sketches, I must have felt like somebody from Germany who's learned English at school and has spent three weeks in England. You know, I mean, I didn't know what they were talking about. Williams and the group of young comedians at the Comedy Store were referring in their act to American brand names and town names, to the way people behaved in certain places. Now, if Williams were in England watching a group of young comics there, he might have had the same problem that John Cleese had that night. Once you go into a shop and say, could I have a face flannel, please? And you suddenly discover, <laughs> as I do from your reaction, that I should have said a washcloth. Uh. And uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of variations in the language, but they're much more just in just little simple nouns, the kind of things you buy in shops. The abstract words that you use in sort of discussions like this tend to be absolutely common. But a lot of humor is about the observation of what people wear and what they buy, and that's where I would get very, very stranded in American comedy. In fact, perhaps only Peter Sellers has been able to bridge the language gap between America and Britain to be accepted as an American comedian in this country and as a British comedian in his own. John Cleese says he has tried to study the nuances of words and accents in America, but has given up. I find it very, very difficult to uh, place an American accent, absolutely impossible to do one. All of which makes the enormous success of Monty Python in America the more astounding. For Python is the only British comedy team which ever has achieved major success here. More on that when this interview with John Cleese continues tomorrow. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 20th, track one. According to their lead guitarist, the Kinks' career has been one of ups and downs. A lot of downs. But maybe he suggests that's one reason for their current success. We'll be talking to Dave Davies about that right after this for Agree. I can't wait to meet your daughter, sir. Well, I'll call her. Evie! What? C come here, would you? This better be good. She's got a lot of spots. Yes. What is it? Evie, I'd like you to meet a nice young man. Oh. <clears throat> I'm afraid her cream rinse makes her hair a little greasy. May I suggest agree? Of course you'd agree. All you have to do is look at her. No, no. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies. Really? Sure. After I shampoo, I use agree cream rinse and conditioner and... And it, it helps stop the greasies. Right. Gee, it sounds like I would like agree, too. Well, agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil-free. Evie, stop crying. I'll go get some agree. And after you use it, I'll drive you to the movies, okay, Evie? No. Why not? Because you got a creepy car. What? It's a brown station wagon. I hate some conditioners contain oils that can cause the greasies, but Agree Cream Rinse and Conditioner is 99% oil-free. And try Agree Shampoo. It helps stop the greasies, too. I'm glad you decided to come to the movie. Your hair looks great. Thank you, and I love your station wagon. Superman, Superman. 
The Kinks turned 16 this year, and seldom as a rock group had a sweeter 16. In fact, Dave Davies, the lead guitarist of the group, says that they're probably more popular than they've ever been. This version of their hit Superman is taken from their current album, the two-record live set, and a bestseller. Not that the Kinks haven't had hit records and triumphant stage shows before. We've never really been like a superstar band, and like we've we've had sort of up and downs, a lot of downs as well. Partly, says Dave, that's because the Kings have followed an admittedly eccentric course, led by Dave's older brother, Ray, the band's songwriter and lead singer. The group has had ambitious concept albums and toured with elaborate entourages, not always successfully. But partly, as one rock music reference book says, the Kings were victims of most of the corporate ills that the record business is heir to. To which Dave replies, Yeah, I'm sure, of course, we, of course we have been. I think when we started, we were sort of right picking for some sort of more ruthless sort of type of personality. But I think that um, people are more aware now. I think that it doesn't go on so much now. That wasn't all, though. The momentum of the Kinks' career in America was broken in the late 60s when they were unable to tour here. We had some problems in about 65, 66 with the immigration authorities. Hmm. I don't know what it was. And we were banned for like three years. Still from his vantage point in 1980, Dave is, as you might say, philosophic. Now he calls that ban interesting. Because that was the period of all the flower people and all that stuff. So maybe we did, did the right thing. Indeed, when you ask him to speculate on the reasons for the king's staying power, Dave replies... I think sometimes when a situation is difficult, it makes you do... Do a thing. When, it's, when things are too easy, you can give up quicker, in a way. And Dave Davies says he feels younger today, in the King's 17th year, than he has for some time. He even has his own album out. We'll be concluding our interview with Dave Davies tomorrow. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Agree. For broadcast on November 20th, track two. Monty Python is generally regarded as a sophisticated adult comedy act, all the more surprising then to learn that it emerged out of a children's television series in England. John Cleese of the Pythons will be talking from Bush Beer. Cowboys don't talk much. If there's a job to be done, I don't jaw about it, I just do it. Spending so much time out riding the line, a fella kind of gets out of the habit of talking. Ain't nobody there to listen. Shoot, I already heard all my horses' stories, and they already heard all my songs. <laughs> but just let a cowboy's work get to him, and he'll talk a blues. What I say isn't fit for a Sunday picnic, but it sure does make me feel better. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West, to the American cowboy. What he lacks in conversation, he makes up for in character. Bush. Head for the beer that always goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed just one way. The naturals that's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush beer. Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri. I wish to make a complaint. We're just closing for lunch. Never mind that, my lad. I wish to complain about this parrot what I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh, yes. The Norwegian blue. What's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, my lad. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. Oh, no, it's resting. Look. Look, my lad. I John Cleese was destined to become a comedian. As a child in grade school, his tall, awkward frame evoked giggles from his fellow students every time he walked on stage during a school play. Most of the time, he says, he appeared in comedies. But as he grew older, he decided he would try his hand at serious drama. He remembers appearing in Marlowe's Faust as the devil's right-hand man. And I had to play loose and becoming out the spotlight. And it was the moment in the play when the whole audience was supposed to leap backwards in their seats and cower under them. And I came out and announced that I was Lucifer, and a sort of roar of laughter echoed around the theatre. That's when you gave up serious drama. I suppose so, yes. And it is perhaps ironic that it was a kid's show on British television that ultimately produced Monty Python.
but fan of that show, which ran during the mid-60s. Being screened at 5.30 in the afternoon called Do Not Adjust Your Set. Very funny. And, of course, it was one of those shows that the parents hurried home to see, you know? And the, the people in the business knew that it was funny. And Cleese was in the business, and had come to know the performers on the kids' show, Michael Palin, Terry Jones, and Eric Idle. Cleese at the time was working with Graham Chapman, television shows and scripts for movies. They all had worked as writers for David Frost. In fact, even while Cleese was going to school at Cambridge, he had written two sketches for the memorable TV series That Was the Week That Was, which featured Frost. One of those sketches, Cleese recalls, was a spoof of astronomy professors. They can never tell you a fact without explaining what it means. You know, they tell you the size of a star, and that means it was the size of... Um, Westminster Cathedral, then this star would be as big as... Do you see what I mean? Everything yeah. gets transformed into these silly comparisons, which don't help you at all, you know. Llamas are larger than frogs. Llamas are dangerous. If you see one, where people are swimming, you shout. Still, there are times today when audiences look at the Monty Pythons and react the way they might if they were attending a boring college lecture. John Cleese will be talking about that experience when his interview with him continues tomorrow. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 21st, track one. Everyone's talking about burnout these days, but the Kinks, after over 16 years of performing, are still going strong. How come? Well, we'll be talking about guitars of the Kinks right after this from Bush Beer. Spend some time in a small town bar in Longhorn Country and keep your ears open. Old Jack Johnson, he had a mouthful of gimme and a handful of much obliged. Why, well, he's bow-legged as barrel hooves and rich enough to be called Mr. I'd like to buy him for what he thinks he's worth. That boy does not have both oars in the water. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West. The everyday poetry of its people. Bush. Head for the beer that always goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed just one way, the natural way. For a taste that's always as smooth. Head for Bush Beer. Head for the mountain. Head for Bush Beer. Head for the mountain. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Dave Davies turned 33 earlier this year, which makes him practically a grand old man by rock and roll standards. He was just 16 when the guitarist first began playing in London in the early 60s. You Really Got Me was the band's first hit in 1964, and Dave has probably played it a couple of thousand times since then. This version is from the group's current live album. But you wouldn't know that to talk to Dave. In fact, when you ask him about his career, he says... Obviously, it's, it's nicer now because observe what's going on around you more. I mean, when I was 16, I didn't really know very much about what, what was going on around me. So you can savour it a bit more now. When you're a bit older, I think it's good. I think that's what makes it more enjoyable. And to work with guys that are still enthusiastic. Cause that's it's just what it's all about, really, is enthusiasm. And Dave says that their audiences have always been extremely important to the Kings. I couldn't sit in the front room day after day. I'd go crazy. But because I can play it in front of new people who respond differently, it makes it different. Of course, there is such a thing as burnout. Teachers talk about it, and executives. Articles have been written about it. And Dave admits that he has felt it, especially when the Kinks' live shows were becoming increasingly elaborate in the mid-70s. There were times that, I don't know, like a few years ago, but I feel sort of younger now. I feel more enthusiastic about what I do now than I did before. I suppose it isn't logical, but... It's the way that it seems. And Dave Davies currently has his own solo album out, and he's been performing some states tour this fall. I have no idea how long it's going to last. I think we're lucky that we're still around and that probably we're more popular now than we've ever been. So, you know, you can't really sort of worry too much about it. <laughs> 
take each day as it comes. Don't worry too much. Have fun and make people happy with your music for all rock and rollers. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio for Bush Beer. Oh, great master. Yes. My daughter and I have traveled far to seek your wisdom. Is that your daughter with the egg? Yes. Say hello, April. Hi. Why is she... Her cream uh... rinse gives her hair the greasy. Oh, daddy. Yes, that bag looks like it held a six-year supply of French fries. Thanks. What can we do, sire? Well, let's see here. Take the root of the imbo bush. I tried that. The juice of the beagle berry. Look, nothing works. I'll have permanent oh. greasies. Oh, no. Now, now, look, I'll tell you what my kids use. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. Agree? Agree? Yes, agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil-free. Oh. So more green. Greasies, I won't have to brown bag it. Yes, my daughter's hair became so beautiful she was elected homecoming queen at Guru U. Wow. How can I thank you for telling me about Agree? Give me some advice. <clears throat> Should I let my daughter wear pantyhose? How old is she? 28. Oh, then I think... Both legs? Yes, both. Fine. You can search the wide world over and may never find anything that can help stop the greasies better than Agree cream rinse and conditioner. And be sure and try to stop the greasies, too. Is this the right room for an argument? I've told you once... No, you haven't. Yes, I have. When? Just now. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. You didn't. I did. You didn't. I'm telling you, I did. You didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a five-minute argument of the full half hour. Ah. Oh. They are the most successful comedy team ever to emerge from England, Monty Python. And they probably arouse more emotions than any other comedy team. In a recent series of performances at the Hollywood Bowl, people in their audiences dressed in the costumes of characters the Pythons have created, and they cheered familiar comedy sketches. Nevertheless, other people don't quite get them at all. Still others, particularly following their movie, The Life of Brian, which spoofed The Life of Christ, others have become downright angry at them. And how has John Cleese of the Pythons reacted to those reactions? Make a joke and the audience goes, ah, ah, ah. And you die of embarrassment. It is the worst thing in the world. I mean, it is just awful. That's why they talk about comics dying. Mm. In a way, they don't talk about actors dying, but comics die. If they don't laugh at all, it becomes hysterically funny. <laughs> when people get angry, I mean, when I've received abusive letter, letter, it shakes you up just as it would if somebody swore at you in the street, you know? Now look, no one is to stone anyone until I blow this whistle. Do you understand? Even if they do say Jehovah. <laughs> Never did Cleese and the other members of Monty Python find themselves at the receiving end of so much abuse as they did after the release of The Life of Brian last year. In America, their movie was mentalist. In Britain, however, they faced the threat of being prosecuted for blasphemy. And it turns out, the film that was distributed in England was different from the film that was distributed in America. It seems the Pythons had consulted their British lawyers. And they said, look, this... Two or three points in the script is slightly suspect, and as far as I remember, we took two of the points out and left the third in because we all felt it was worth being prosecuted. Nothing happened, you know. In the end, the furor died down, and there are some commentators who now insist that The Life of Brian was a profoundly religious film, something which John Cleese insists he believes as well. He has become something of a religious scholar over the years, and he says... But in fact, I suppose it's the only thing, the only thing, really, that I ultimately consider interesting. Really? Yes. Well, it is the... One thing about the members of Monty Python, they never cease surprising you. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Agree. For broadcast on November 22nd, track one. A psychic advised the new rock group Ghost Riders to acquire a most unusual instrument. We've heard voices come out of it that... Are that didn't make sense at all. We don't know what, what they were, and we, we may never find out. We call it the ghost beam. And I'll be talking to ghost writers Daniel Stickler and Gary Gossett about the ghost beam after this for Agree. I can't wait to meet your daughters. Evie! What? C come here, would you? This better be good. She's got a lot of spots. Yes. What is it? Evie, I'd like you to meet a nice young man. Oh, no, my hair looks dirty. Daddy, how could you do this to me? I want to die. <laughs> I'm afraid her cream rinse makes her hair a little greasy. May I suggest agree? Of course you'd agree. All you have to do is look at her. No, no. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies. Really? Sure. After I shampoo, I use it. And it, it helps stop the greasies. Right. Gee, it sounds like I would like agree, too. Well, agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil-free. Evie, stop crying. I'll go get some agree. And after you use it, I'll drive you to the movies, okay, Evie? No. Why not? Because you got a creepy car. What? It's a brown station wagon. I hate 
Some conditioners contain oils that can cause the greasies. But Agree Cream Rinse and Conditioner is 99% oil-free. And try Agree Shampoo. It helps stop the greasies, too. I'm glad you decided to come to the movie. Your hair looks great. Thank you. And I love your station wagon. The new group Ghost Riders is a strange and mystical background. According to guitarist Daniel Stickler and drummer Gary Gossett, the group was formed on the advice of a psychic. Financial support was given as a result of a psychic reading. Even one of their musical instruments was built because of a psychic suggestion. A 12-foot steel guitar called a beam. It was invented in 1950, but has had only limited use since then. Stickler and Gossett say Ghost Riders is the first rock group to amplify a beam and experiment with its heavy vibrations and their effect on the human body. If you become the same vibration as the vibration of the beam, then you can literally be transparent with that vibration. And you've discovered that if you let the beam vibrate for a certain length of time, that the waves in the room become so thick it actually sounds your like voice it, changes your voice everything. changes it, it when you talk it sounds like you're talking into a fan if you ever did that when you were a little kid the ghost beam as they call it has 21 strings and weighs 300 pounds and according to stickler and gossett they have to be extremely careful when using it in performance because of what they call super cosmic things things like with astral projection with psychic things like turning, you know, to where your third eye can see clairvoyancy or... I've know, had an out-of-body like experience from it myself. For a rock musician to say he had an out-of-body experience might cause some people to wonder if the band was stoned. Sometimes straight, sometimes stoned. And with me, I left my body when I was straight. But I've had some, some weird things happen when I was high, too. We can only imagine. Stickler and Gossett say that the ghost beam can't be reproduced very well on record, but they say it's great for live performances. We have a certain sound system that we use, you know, to crank it out and vibrate the low frequencies, and most people's stereo systems won't handle the beam. It's on the new Ghost Rider album, say Stickler and Gossett, but it had to be kept at a very low level because it drowned out the other instruments. It's used on the song um, Enchant on the first side. If you turn uh, up the bass, the you can song on the first feel it. Like a, it's like taking a bath. It's real soothing. But who needs a bath if you don't have a body? This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Agree. For broadcast on November 22nd, track two. If you've ever been hypnotized and found out later that you made a fool of yourself, well, hypnotherapist James Hoke says it's not the fault of the hypnotist. The fool is in you. I'll be talking to Hoke about that right after this from Bush Beer. Sometimes a man's got a lot to say, even if he doesn't talk much. A.T. Brownlow. Now there's a guy who don't talk much. Last winter, I was riding fences, holed up in a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere. Boss sends A.T. out to help. First night he's there, I heard cattle noise. Bull, I says. Cow, he says. And that's all. Next morning, he's packing his saddlebags. Gotta go, he says. What for, I says. Can't stand an argument, he says. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West. Simple, hard-working men of few words who get the job done. Bush. Head for the beer that goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed the natural way, so it's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush beer. Head for the mountain. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, my friends, how would you like to get rid of that crippling fear? Make marriage or sex exciting again. Be a persuasive public speaker or give successful parties. Well, all of that and more is yours, according to James Hoke, if you can just master the techniques he sets out in his book, I Would If I Could and I Can. I'm an emotional cheerleader. That's what I do. And my thing is the reconstruction of the... Uh 
accidental jigsaw puzzle of life that most people, they get a bunch of pieces and they can't put them together. Most people's problems, says Hoke, are rooted in their childhood, buried traumas that push through into adulthood to express themselves in bothersome ways. We didn't start out all screwed up, he says. You and I were born with a blank head, tabula rasa, zero, blank tablet, nothing going on. We learn the emotions and the feelings from our circumstances. It's about 95% of what you and I are is an accident. We don't pick our name, our parents, our color, our school, our church we went to, anything. It's all mm. picked for us. So your emotional concepts, your self-image, your fears, your hang-ups, your doubts, your limits, they're all conditioned by other people. And if you buy what has been written on your head as being verbatim truth, then you're in big trouble. And big trouble is where Hope comes into the picture with his eyes aglow. You see, Hoke is a hypnotherapist. He says he uses hypnosis to regress a person back to when he or she was a child. He seeks out those hidden traumas, confronts the person with it, and at the snap of a finger, that crippling fear is gone. Or perhaps a persuasive public speaker is born. And of course, you can do all of this yourself. That's what Hoke's book is all about, self-hypnosis. But you must realize, he says, that hypnosis cannot put anything into your head which isn't already there. If I say to you when you wake up you're going to bark like a dog, fine, Lou barks like a dog. He knows what a dog sounds like. I zap Lou and I say when you wake up you're going to make the sound of a sermon. You wake up, nothing happens. <laughs> There's nothing in there to relate to a sermon. What the hell kind of sound does that make? You will make no sound. So I obviously didn't put anything in. What The first time around I pulled out your awareness of what a dog sounds like. So when you use hypnosis or the techniques of hypnosis, you pull out what is already there. And I suppose that for those people who can't be hypnotized, they'll just have to go through life giving unsuccessful parties. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 23rd, Never Kick a Bear in Your Bedroom Slippers. That's the title of a new book by movie and television wild animal trainer Dick Robinson, who lived to tell about it. Tell about it all, about the book and about the bear. I'll be talking to him about that after this from Bush Beer. There's poetry in the West. You can hear it in the way people talk about everyday things, like fences. There's a lot of sorry things can happen to a fence. Or children. She's cuter than a speckled pup under a red wagon. The cowhand's bunkhouse. I hung my clothes on the floor so they wouldn't fall down and get lost. Even personal finances. I'm so broke I can't even pay attention. Here, then, is a bush beer to the best of the West. The everyday poetry of its people. Bush. Head for the beer that always goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Bush. Brewed just one way, the natural way, for a taste that's always as smooth as its name. Bush. Head for Bush Beer. Head for the mountain. Head for Bush Beer. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Wild animal trainer Dick Robinson has been involved in animal movies like Grizzly Adams and Jeremiah Johnson, and his television credits include several Wild Kingdom segments. Now, one would think Robinson knows how to handle animals, and yet he tells this story. I had a bear that was had a big long trailer, and his cage is out at the back, so I, I was sleeping in the truck, and he was pacing the end of the cage, and, and I got really upset about it, and I went back, and I told him, I says, you know, stop it, will you? And um, so he kind of growled at me, and I walked in the cage, and, and I had my soft bedroom slippers on, which were fleece-lined, and... So I gave him a wallop with my foot, and he bit my leg. An indication to most people that it's time to retreat, but not to Robinson. And I walloped him again, and after 20 times, I completely smashed my big toe, and he had gnawed on my leg something fierce. And um, I never did get the impression over to him that he was not supposed to do that, but he got the impression over to me that, um, you know, don't kick a bear in your bedroom slippers because it's going to cripple you, and it did. It also resulted in a $1 million lawsuit for failure to finish Grizzly Adams. Uh, but that's another story. Anyway, a few years after the movie, Robinson says, he was hypnotically regressed to his past lives, where, he says, he discovered he had actually been Grizzly Adams. He also says he started seeing spirits everywhere. 
His personal spirit guide, says Robinson, is an old Indian named Porcupine. I couldn't have got anybody better if I'd tried. I get, uh, I get a group of body signals that said, hey, we want to talk to you, because, you know, they ring you up on the telephone just like anybody else. So my body signals for this particular entity is just right through my eye right here. I just got a whoosh, shot of pain right through my eye. And I was sitting out here in your waiting room, and... Somehow he said, you know, he wants to talk to me. So that means tonight when I go back, I'll sit down with my typewriter and I'll type out a page that he has to say to me. And it seems Porcupine has a lot to say. Robinson says he's written five books since December. And what has he learned from his involvement with the spirit world? I don't think a spirit's any better than anybody else. All, just because they're dead doesn't make them smart. Mm. They have got a lot of contacts on the other side that we don't have, naturally. Apparently, Porcupine's contacts are helping Robinson. He recently was featured on TV's Those Amazing Animals, and he has a soon-to-be-released movie called Robinson's Wilderness. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Bush Beer. For broadcast on November 23rd, track two. When I asked David Schoenbrunn for a microphone check before I began my interview with him, he intoned the words he had repeated nearly every day for 14 years of his life. This is David Schoenbrunn, CBS News, Paris. That was back during the golden age of television, and Schoenbrunn will be comparing that TV age with the current one after this for Agree. Oh, great master. Yes? My daughter and I have traveled far to seek your wisdom. Is that your daughter with the, uh... Bag over her head. Bag. Yes, say hello, April. Hi. Why is she, Her cream uh... rinse gives her hair the greasy. Oh, daddy. Yes, that bag looks like it held a six-year supply of French fries. Thanks. What can we do, sire? Well, let's see here. Take the root of the imbo bush. I tried that. The juice of the beagle berry. Look, nothing works. I'll have permanent oh. greasies. Oh, no. Now, now, look, I'll tell you what my kids use. Agree cream rinse and conditioner. Agree? Agree? Yes, agree cream rinse and conditioner is 99% oil. Free. Oh. So it helps stop the greasies. No more greasies. I won't have to brown bag it. Yes, my daughter's hair became so beautiful she was elected homecoming queen at Guru U. Wow. How can I thank you for telling me about Agree? Give me some advice. <clears throat> Should I let my daughter wear pantyhose? How old is she? 28. Oh, then I think... Both legs? Yes, both. Fine. You can search the wide world over and may never find anything that can help stop the greasies better than Agree cream rinse and conditioner. And be sure and try Agree shampoo. It helps stop the greasies too. David Schoenbrunn is short, bald, sports a small, brush-like mustache, and speaks of the eloquent style of high society. He is, in short, quite the opposite of television's current breed of handsome, happy-talking news. Yet, for 18 years, Schoenbrunn was one of CBS News' omnipresent figures, as that network's Paris correspondent, then chief Washington reporter during the Kennedy administration, and finally, as European bureau chief. But he left CBS 15 years ago, in utter frustration, it would seem. In television, between me and the audience, there are sound men and light men and editors and cutters and producers and directors, and it's very difficult to tell your story in television. Schoenbrunn was part of what was then called the Ed Murrow team on CBS. Murrow was unquestionably the most influential figure in the history of television news. In those days, Schoenbrunn says, the reporter was king. Nowadays, he suggests, the news producer is king, and films of a brush fire in California may take precedence over a reporter's analysis of a new political crisis in the Middle East. And they have this terrible, terrible name that they call people like me. They call us talking heads, which is just awful. Ed Morrow, by the way, uh, refused to become a television anchor man on a news program. He said it was frivolous and unimportant. He did one hour and one hour and a half deep studies of a very important question, and very exciting, too. But those dramatic, provocative documentaries, programs which could bring down a demagogic senator or alter the lives of thousands of migrant workers, those kinds of programs are rarely seen on television today. But then TV reporters no longer are able to become specialists. Schoenbrunn spent 14 years working in Paris, no television reporter spends that much time in one place today. If there's a fire in Jerusalem, get on a plane and go to Jerusalem. If something bursts in Tokyo, get on a plane and go to Tokyo. They are really ambulance chasers and firemen. Generally uh, good-looking ones. And generally very pretty. Uh, it's, it's really not 
a good news medium. Sean Brun does still make occasional appearances on television, principally on a new television news network. But in order for him to tell a story thoroughly and effectively these days, he has to write it down. He is the author of the recently published book about the World War II French resistance. And he feels about television today, he suggests, the way an aunt of his does, who once told him, television's all right, David, but it goes in one eye and out the other. This is Lou Irwin, Earth News Radio, for Agree.